Hey, it's Bill the Young. You knew that? It's the Catalyst Session. And if you're watching, you knew that too. Thanks again for uh, checking in with us. I want to say hello to um, best-selling novelist Lisa Unger, who's right here with us. Um, we're here to talk about what I guess is your 20th book. Um, it's my 18th, my 18th novel. Okay. Well, I mean, but you know, there are other, I mean, there's short stories, of course, and and there's a novella as well. So if we're counting that, I, if we're counting those, we're probably over 20. At the okay. Point. Well, anyway, it, it's a lot and it's called, it's called yeah. Confessions in the 745 and it's, yeah. it's absolutely brilliant. And I was just telling Lisa, I literally just finished it this morning. So, uh, and I did that very purposefully to be able to talk about it with you. Yeah. That's great. I love that. As opposed to just sort of saying, yeah, I read it over the summer and, you know. Yeah. So, um, first thing I, I would say was, this is so intricately plotted, Lisa, but you have said to me and to other people that you don't use an outline. I, I found that hard to believe that you didn't plan this. There's so many twists and turns and then it does that. I'm not giving anything away. <laughs> I, was um, I, don't, I, I don't work with an outline. I, I never have. I am... Um, you know, usually everything starts with, you know, a germ, like an idea. And in the case of confessions, it was this idea. It was that you can't con an honest man. So I had that idea kicking around in my head for a while. And I wound up bringing it up in a green room one day with a couple of my author pals right before a panel that we were all supposed to go on. And one of my author friends said, I don't know, that kind of sounds like victim blaming to me. And I thought, okay, yeah, I hear that. And so it led me to do a lot of research about, um, you know, the confidence game yeah, and the con artist and the psychology of the victim of a con. And I wound up reading a book called The Confidence Game by Maria Konnikova. And I came away with a much more layered idea about that, which was you can't con somebody who doesn't want something and everybody wants something. Yeah. So everybody's vulnerable. I think somebody says that in the book, somebody yeah. who will go unnamed at this point. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that, so I came away with that idea. And with that idea, I started hearing the voices of Selena and Pearl. Those were the two main voices that drew me through the narrative. And I, um, I, every story evolves for me in this way. I just have this idea, this kind of nebulous sort of feeling. I have these voices in my head and then these characters evolve on the page for me, much in the same way that they do later for my reader. That's, and that's how I, that's how I have written every book. It's interesting that you, you've said that because that the characters basically tell you where they're going. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna do this now. Um, I, I wondered if there were occasions where, because this is very, very twisty, where, where they said, we're going here, and you had to say, no, I don't think that's good. I mean, how often does that happen? I mean. <laughs> you don't have any authority. I didn't see the twist, I didn't see them going. <laughs> yeah, whether, whether it's like, they say. tell you and you have to rein them in and say, no, that's not good for you. You wouldn't yeah. do that. Yeah, if you, I mean, I think that, you know, if you start, if you start trying to control your characters, then you're, you're, you're sort of violating the process in a sense. You know, um, I think, you know, there, there can be that impulse or this idea that maybe the, the author is on the outside looking down and moving pieces. And certainly I, I do think some people write that way and maybe to good effect, but I don't. I'm always very deeply inside what's happening. And I was just, I was just reading um, Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott, which is like one of my most favorite books on craft. And oh. I've read it a million times and it's definitely, it's, it's like a, a, you know, it's something I open whenever I'm feeling sort of lost or not sure what's happening in, you know, in my manuscript or in my revisions or whatever. And I usually open it up to just like one page and whatever page that is, usually the answer is there. <laughs> wow, that's cool. And, and so I, I, I read just in the last couple of days and I don't remember ever reading this in the book before, but of course I have, is that she says that her characters develop like, the, like a Polaroid picture. 
you know, they just kind of slowly, you know, come into view. And that really resonated for me in that, in that moment. And that, that's really, that's really true for how I do the work. And there really isn't a whole lot. I mean, I know that, I mean, obviously I'm a professional writer, right? I have a craft. I've been a writer since I was a kid. My entire education is devoted to writing. I've been a reader since I was a kid. I've dedicated myself to honing my craft as a writer. But the very biggest part of it often feels like it's happening on a subconscious level. And so even though I know I'm exerting control, I don't really know how. Some of these people are not very nice. So you're telling me they're controlling you. The voices in your head are controlling you. And it, what I meant about with the question about outlines and plotting is that since there are so many twists and turns, and uh, some folks are rather duplicitous in this book, let's say. Um, mm, yeah. I, I find it just hard to imagine that you didn't know any of that going into the story. You didn't say, okay, I have to get to this ending. How do I do that? And it doesn't yeah. work that way for you, does it? It doesn't. I mean, it's really more like the story's there, you know, I just have to find it kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's really more, more how I experience it. Like the plot flows from character. It's the character, the characters that are the actors. So it's not as though you can, oh, it's not as though I construct a plot and plenty, again, plenty of writers do work this way and to great success. You know, the plot is outlined, it is constructed. The characters are conceived they're plugged into the plot as needed. A lot of people do write this way. Yeah. Um, but it's not, it, for me, the character exists and then the plot flows from their action. So it's, a, it's the opposite way, I guess, or maybe not so opposite. It's just a different way of, of arriving at the story. There were so many things in your internal, the internal monologues of Pearl and of uh, Selena, where I thought, you know, they're, they're two, two different worldviews, two different yeah. points of view. And, Utterly and, it was, different. and it was, it was brilliant the way they were sort of juxtaposed. And I also, there's a point to all this, so give me a minute. But no, I also, please. there were times when I really liked Graham. And there were, of course, times when I really didn't. And we'll, right. we'll leave it there. But he was also very, very different. And I think that's your skill as a writer is to inhabit those characters and give them, you know, completely different worldviews, different brains. I wanted to ask you, Selena's our protagonist. And I wondered, I guess, uh, sort of, yeah. yeah, for purposes of, of, of what mm -hmm. we're saying here today, uh, you know, sort of a, a suburban wife with kids. And how much of her is in came from you. I mean, how much of that was like, I can, I can talk this talk. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, I mean, it's kind of a layered answer, right? You know, so every character, I, I, I always think about my characters as people that I meet and not as people that I create. Mm -hmm. And that is not, of course, the truth of it, really. I mean, it's how I experience it, but every character is an amalgamation of my experiences, my thoughts and ideas, my, people that I maybe know, people that I I am or have been, um, people that I can imagine, my biases, it's right, it's a, just a, every character is a blend of, of, of all of those things. But Selena is probably, you know, in, in many ways closer to me than say, for example, Pearl. Yeah. Right, yeah. because you know, here's a space where like, so, so Selena is basically like, she's this superwoman that this culture is so good at producing, mm -hmm. right? You know, she's got it all. She's the mom. She's got this big career, you know, big job in the city, beautiful home in the suburbs, you know, and she's created this kind of facade of herself, this Instagrammable Selena, right? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and she's so very invested in the facade of her life and what it, and what she's showing that, you know, she's kind of turned away from the, from the rot. In her in her marriage yeah. and from the things that are not perfect and there are things that she knows that she needs to change that she just can't bring herself to change and she can't bring herself to tell anybody about all the things that are wrong and that are bothering her because she's created this this fiction of herself still she questions it constantly she yeah. does i mean yeah. she's at least self-aware 
yeah. you know, she's at least aware that she's, do, that she's doing that, that she's doing this. And so, you know, I think that's something that we can maybe all relate to in this moment in time, you know, where social media has become such a big part of our lives yeah. and that, you know, we're sort of telegraphing all this information about ourselves all the time. Some of it's true and some of it's, you know, not. Some of it's just a fiction of ourselves that we're, that we're creating. Which is so, this is, I'm, I'm blowing smoke out of you, but that's one of the things that's so beautifully done in this book because your other main character also has this sort of, image that she's projecting. I mean, it, it's, 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 it's subtle, but it's there when you see it. It's like, oh my God, in a way they're doing the same thing. Right, it is. It's very, it's very similar. Like, so as you say, they have completely different worldviews and yet, you know, they're both sort of running a con. One of, yeah. one of the cons is like sort of, you know, the normal con that we're all running or the one that we're all complicit in or that we're all like sort of, you know, trying to navigate, you know, on a daily basis. And the other one is a little bit more nefarious, but essentially, you know, it's, it's all, it, it's very, it's very, it's very similar. So they do have completely different worldviews, but they're, they're not, what they're doing is not, is not so very different. Well, I thought that you, you captured the whole social media thing so well uh, with, you know, these Facebook posts about my perfect life yeah. and all of that stuff. And then someone, again, we won't say who, involved in a con, we won't say what, uh, uses that. Yeah, absolutely. Like she's putting out all these details of her yeah. lives. And I think that this is another thing that, you know, and it was one of my takeaways from some of my research and something that I already knew because I have been researching this for a long time is that, you know, we have essentially given away our privacy. You know, we are out when, when you're out there broadcasting yourself in social media, you know, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, you know, here I am girls night out, here I am at my kids school bake sale, here I am at my work, my work picnic. You've literally just given somebody, you know, three major things about you that they can use to social engineer you and to manipulate you and get yeah. your data. And, you know, there's the sort of societal con of like, you know, the advertisers are all over your stuff, figuring yeah. out very, very intelligently what you want and how to market it to you. And then, you know, there might be a more nefarious layer to that, you know, some con artist who, you know, is looking at your life and deciding that, you know, for whatever reason, you're the mark. And you basically told that person everything that they, um, that they need to know about you. You, you mentioned research, uh, the character Pop, uh, is that somebody you had to, uh, so the details of that sort of lifestyle? Is that somebody you had to like learn a lot yeah, about? I mean, yeah. so I do a lot. I mean, my life, you know, I have a, like just an ongoing research project that is kind of my life. I mean, even psychology is, <laughs> is, is one of my major obsessions. So yes, I know you said. You said it was uh, between imagination and skill was your craft, but then you should have been a psychologist. You right, told me I that. should have been because yeah. this is what this is my the driving force, right? Through all of my novels, is me trying to answer the questions that I have about people. Yeah, right. Like this is this is why I think in many ways it's why I write because I'm just deeply deeply curious about what makes us who we are. And so somebody like Pop, again, you know, a lot of research goes into that. And, um, but mainly like, I, I, so I think that I, I heard, Mar maybe we've talked about this before. I heard Meryl Streep being interviewed, right? And she was asked like, how could she so inhabit these characters and these people that are not her, nothing yeah. like her, no, no relation to her life at all. Yeah. Yeah. And um, she said that she believed that within every person was the germ for every other person. And that all you had to do was access your empathy and that it was really not so hard to imagine why people did the things they did, even the very worst people. Yeah. Um, and it's, uh, you know, that, that struck me as being very, tr being very true. And it, it, it was sort of like, I, 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 I was fascinated by the, uh, by the evolution, let's say, of his relationship with Pearl and, right. and, and, and how that changed. And I never really understood it, which was good. There was always that air of mystery that right. I, you know, I imagine you did on purpose. There was never a turning point. I never really got what he wanted. Oh, you know, yeah. You know, which, yeah which I, was, I, I could see how that would be difficult to, to understand. I'm sorry. In a good way. I mean, I'm glad I didn't know. 
can I, I have to make you, I have to stop one second. My dog just turned on the television. <laughs> they do that at your house, they do they? Do. <laughs> <laughs> can you stop, Bubba? Well, while Lisa's away, let's talk about confessions on the 745. It's really good. <laughs> I'm saying nice things about you while you're not here. Oh, thank you. you that is such a zoo. Oh, that oh. Is a, this is the second time he's done this. He like lies on the on the remote and it turns on the TV. And if he if he does it again, then it turns on the show that we were last watching. So <laughs> <laughs> it could happen yeah. again because trying to get him off the remote might not work. That's but yeah, so I mean he was a very interesting he was a very interesting uh character to me as well. I mean, they all are, of course, you know, I spend a lot of time like just basically upset, obsessed about my characters and who they are and what they are. Yeah. I mean, he was probably, and this may be true of many of the men in the book, that they're probably less accessible to the reader than are the women. This mm -hmm. is very much a, 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 you know, their story. This is very much the story of the women in the book. And well, so, you, you uh, see, if I may, I mean, you see Graham reflected through Selena's views and thoughts about him. That's, that's right. true. Very true. Yeah. So you never really see his perspective. You never really, and, and, you know, to be frank, you know, most of us are just like sort of sick of that perspective. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to know what he was thinking. We don't want to know what he was thinking. <laughs> like, really, we don't. We just want him to be dealt with yeah. in a sense. And so I think that, and, and, and Pop, um, is, you know, I mean, we get dangerously close to giving, giving things away, but, you know, he, you know, I guess we can talk about him in relationship to, to Pearl, mm -hmm. um, where, you know, Pearl is the first thing we learn about her is that, you know, she's a watcher, right? That she, who, she her super, her superpower is to make herself invisible and to, to watch the people in her life. And this is a very typical psychology of the abused child. Um, so like, not that she's necessarily abused by Stella, but she's definitely neglected, abandoned by her father. And Stella is this un sort of unpredictable force in her life, her mother. Yeah. And so she's Pearl's like a survivor though. And so she's learned how to survive in this circumstance with this person, her mother, who she relies on for all of her resources. So she's learned to survive and she's learned to survive by being a watcher. And and so then enter uh, a, enter a, a, a strange man into the picture, a man that we know as Charlie. And he, um, you know, he kind of sees that in her. And whether he is actually in a relationship with Stella or whether that relationship is just a way for him to get closer to Pearl, we are, we never really know that's that. Right. That's what I mean. I, I was never really sure. And I think this was brilliant. I'm not saying that right. it bothered me. I thought it was great. That, we that, never really that know. That enigmatic quality that he had. Right. Like, what did he want? We still, we, at yeah. the end, we don't know because ultimately, you know, he was a very, um, you know, a, a very disturbed individual. And yet, in some sense, in some sense, he, you know, he cared for Pearl and he took care of her in a way that nobody else ever did. Yeah. And he gave her skills that, you know, she was uniquely qualified to absorb. When we spoke in June, Lisa, I went back and looked, it was June. I mean, it's hard, it's hard. It feels like it was, in one way, it feels like it was a year ago. In another way, it feels like it was maybe a week and a half. Right. Uh, but I, I went back and watched that again and, and, Confessions was, you already had the advanced copies. In fact, you sent me one and I sat on it until I knew I was going to talk to you again. Yeah. So it's been around for a while, but it didn't come out until October. And I want, and I mean, it's, I mean, that was the pub, the pub day, you know, but I wonder if you were sort of going, oh, just you wait, wait till this one drops, you know, because yeah. there was no occasion really, I guess, to talk about it yet with the media <laughs> or with, your readers or anybody was there do you have that anticipation like wait till you see this next one I, you know i really don't because you know honestly like that so confessions on the 745 like you say it was around in 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 uh, in june in, in galley form yeah um but prior you know that book was completed a year ago really? so it's been a year since i since i even finished the second, you know, the second round of like the editorial, ver you know, the editorial draft. 
So it's been since October of last year that it's been done. My, I try to always have my book completed before my next one comes out. Uh -huh. That's how, that's my routine and that's how. So I'm already in another headspace, another world with other, with other characters. And it's interesting because it takes me that long, you know, and, I'll, and this goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Like I write without an outline. I have some nebulous idea of where things are gonna go. These characters, they evolve on the page. You know, I have a first draft, then of course, you know, there's a lot of editorial work that goes into that. Um, and then it's another year before it winds up on the shelves and that I wind up talking about it. So it's almost only now that I'm talking about it that I really know what it was about. You know, like in a very true sense, you know, when I first sort of sit down like with that galley and I'm getting ready to do my first interview, whatever that's going to be, I have to look at it and go, okay, what, what, what was do I the want to story? say? Who are these what, people? <laughs> what was this? What was this? What did I, what came, what came wow. from within and is on the page and now I, I'm, I'm out in the world to talk about it. So it's never like an anticipation, like I cannot wait for this book to publish. I mean, in fact, you know, it's, there's a, a, a very unique set of anxieties that you surround publication time. Um, but it's, you know, it's very much so the moment where I kind of connect with the book in this way where I can say, okay, this is what Confessions on the 745 is about. So when you start your round of media interviews, which I, I guess you're doing now, excuse me. See, I have one too, but that wasn't See, it's always book. something. It's the right. phone, it's uh, the TV. Yeah. So you're, do, you're doing your, your press stuff now for the yeah. book. I mean, did you literally, like you say, have to go back to the galley or to the, the finished book and sort of say, no, what was my motivation here? D is it all gone? You no, 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 it's not gone. It's not a matter of like, oh, I have to open the book and read it. It's a matter that like I access that part of my brain. So it's kind of like, you know, there's a, there's two different brains. There's the creative brain, the brain that writes, and then there's the rest of me that, you know, lives my life and goes out into the world and, you know, does my book tours under nor normal circumstances and, you know, talks to media and, you know, makes a sandwich and takes my daughter to school and all that. That is another, per that's another human being. It's another person. Well, you, what a great segue for me. To, to, this is what I wrote down, which is let's talk about your catalyst. Uh, you, I think you, you told me this, this is a great way to talk about doing publicity for your book. You yeah. were, you were a publishing house publicist for what, 10 years? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And, and your story, which is just brilliant. This is again, what I watched again this morning was that you just said, I'm, I'm a writer and, and I don't want to do this anymore. I, I'm going to like follow my bliss or whatever the expression. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'd like to talk about that moment for a minute, you know, where you had that famous Peggy Lee line, is that all there is? Is that all there is? You know? Yeah, it's yeah. such an interesting thing. My journey is an interesting one because I was always a writer. I've been a writer since I was a kid, you know, since I was, you know, and a reader before that. So always in love with story. My mom was a librarian. But my dad was an engineer. I don't, well, I mean, he's retired. I don't know if you ever stopped being an engineer, like sort of a, you know, it's a vocation. It's a oh, calling. Sure. And, um, yeah. and I, I wanted to know, you know, like, can I do this? You know, like if I can be so moved by other people's words and characters and create these stories, if other people can do this, can I do it? And my dad was like, no, you know, you can't. <laughs> it was like, a writer is not a job description. Not a real job, right? <laughs> you know, like people don't do that. You get a real job. You know, like here's the deal. You, I've got you covered through four years of college, and you can take basket weaving for all I care during that time frame. Um, but when you graduate in four years, when you graduate, you are off the payroll. So don't move home to write your first novel and like don't travel around Europe to find yourself just get to work tough love man yeah right but I mean yeah. it's not the worst advice in the world but you know definitely as a writer like as a creative and as a you know somebody who spent your entire education focused on writing and literature and, and English I was like well I mean I guess the closest thing I can do to following my dreams without actually putting any skin in the game is to go into publishing yeah and so I did that and so 
you know, I did that and I kind of walked into that, to that world. And, you know, unfortunately I happened to be extremely good at my job, like very good at it as a book publicist. Yeah. And so my job just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And the time I spent writing just kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller until I reached the point in my life where I realized everything was wrong. I was with the wrong guy. I was, you know, in a job that I, I was devoting 110% of myself to that I didn't love and that the only thing I ever wanted to do, I was letting it just, you know, fade away. Do you have to, when that moment comes, that light bulb, I mean, do you have to take the publicist job and deep six it and say, okay, no. I'm, I'm writing. I'm, can, can you write at night? Or, or yes, like, of say, course. Just do it. You're yeah, I mean, too, way too much of my dad in me. Like, do not quit your day job, for okay. God's sakes, don't. Because <laughs> mm. I did not. At that point, I just got really serious about my writing. You yeah. know, at that point, I was like, you know, a writer doesn't think about writing. A writer doesn't talk about writing. A writer doesn't make excuses for why she didn't write that day. She just writes. And so if that means you have an hour before you go to work, that means you have a lunch break. If that means you stay in on the weekends, if that means you, you know, don't do some of the other things that you have committed to do, you make a, you make a date with yourself every day if you can, every week if that's what you have. You make an appointment with yourself. You schedule the time. And you honor the schedule and you finish your novel. And that's you still, do you still do that? Oh, yes. Like writing times like, yeah, 7 a.m. these days or whatever it is. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, it's for me, it's and uh, my golden creative hours are from 5 a.m. to noon. Mm. That's my golden block of creativity, which is not to say I don't write at every other time or that I always am at my desk by five or that, you know, if I'm on deadline, I might be writing you know, until I get, you know, until it's time for dinner to make dinner, to get called to dinner or whatever. Right. So that's, you know, that's the, you know, um, the schedule of a professional writer, you write, you know, but, but for me, like those, those, uh, those early morning hours are the most, you know, most important, even if I don't get the first creative cycle before my daughter wakes up, you know, the five to 7 a.m., then that middle cycle, the eight to noon, that block is very important. It's very important. One last question on this subject. When you say, okay, well, I, it's, I had stopped because it's dinner time or whatever. This has happened to me before on the, the scale that I write. You're, you're, you're on a roll. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Pearl is doing something outrageous and where's this going? I can't, and wait, it's dinner time. Hold off, guys. I'm yeah. a, I mean, do you do that? Like, so give me another I, half an hour here. I tend to block my cycles. I tend to block my creative cycles. A, a few years ago, I read a book called Deep Work by Cal Newport. Mm -hmm. And I tend, to, I tend to block my day. So I know when my daughter's going to need me. I'm a mom. So my daughter always comes first. So that's just, that's just the big rock. You know yeah. how they talk about putting the rocks in the jar. She's the big rock always, right? She's a teenager now, so she's more in charge of herself. But like, I tend to like, I tend to know what her day is, what my day is, and then each day I'm going to say, okay, so from five to seven, I'm going to try to get a creative block. From eight to noon, I'm going to try to get a creative block. Where I'm going to eat, and then maybe from one to two, I'm going to get one more creative cycle in or maybe a shallow work cycle, like email, social media, whatever it winds up being. But it's not I always, can't... your life isn't always that regimented though, and the creative impulses. No. What, if, what, if, what I'm saying is the creative, like I got a great plot line that just came to me, mm -hmm. but it's time for the block to end. You would always just say, yeah, I'll pick this up later. Can you do that? Well, I mean, if you, you know, to be honest, you know, four hours of focused creative work is about the maximum that a brain can manage. And that's, uh, to, be, to be honest, that's a lot because that's because I'm a trained creative professional that's been writing, you know, for, you know full time for like 20 years, right? So, yeah. But mo most creative blocks are like, you know, for most people, 90 minutes would be a lot. And that's the point at which your brain starts going, mm, I'm, 
I'm tired. <laughs> yeah, or I'm hungry. I need, like, a, I need a dopamine hit. Let me get on Twitter or like whatever. Right. Okay. <laughs> whatever. Like, whatever. It's like that's the point where your brain is like. So like if you got four solid hours of creativity in, and you're still churning it out, you know, at the end of that that time, I would imagine you've got some kind of augmentation going on. Hmm. <laughs> Or you might be getting diminished results. And, and right. Like you might be getting can. diminished results. And yes. also, there's a kind of a fantasy idea about, like, you know, create, you know, like, create, like, I get hit with the muse and I must go off and work on my whatever okay. it is. And, yeah. and that, that, that is true. I mean, you do, you do get that. But, like, I think, too, that it, the, the act of creativity is also a trem is an act of discipline. And if you have a disciplined schedule where you say to yourself, I'm here for three hours, I'm not doing anything else but writing. And you do that consistently every day, you know, in your life, or if it's just an hour on Sunday or it, whatever it is that you have around your full-time job, then you'll be amazed at how focused and how often creativity meets you in the space that you have created. For how it. cool is that? I wonder, you know, I'm going to make this my last question because I'm taking up so much of your time, but it, it, you make me curious. If in, you're, I, you're very focused, which is so admirable, middle of the night, if Geneva, say, comes to you and says, this is what I'm going to do. I mean, do you ever have to run downstairs and write it down? Or if I wake up, and I do often, if I wake up, because um, I do dream about my work, then I, then I get up and I work. And that's... That's bad. Oh, it is? <laughs> bad for, that's bad for life. It, I was going to say, how cool, how, how cool is that? It's great for fiction, but bad for life. <laughs> the characters won't let you sleep. I was going to say, well, that's pretty cool. So listen, uh, our time is up. Lisa Unger, thank you again thank you. for being here. I want to remind everybody, Confessions on the 745 is out now, and it's really good. Um, we'll catch up with you next time, I'm sure. I, I would love that. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat about the book. Take care now.